Purim, by the way, for those who don't know, the word Purim actually means like uh, li- uh, lots or, or dice, the kind of things you roll to, to make a decision on something. Anyway, so that's what the name comes from. When they rolled the dice to, uh, the, the, to select a date on which to kill all the Jews. And it came out uh, to the 14th of Adar. So what is the principle? Let me ask you now. Here's a challenge question. What is the principal ceremony of Purim? What do you think that is? Making noise? Anything? Okay, just let me help you out. It's not dressing up in costumes. That's not the principal ceremony. What it is is reading the Megillat Esther, which is uh, Megillat Esther. Megillat means scroll or book. So where the and direction for the holiday is to read from the book of Esther. And in the traditional Jewish community, they also do a lot of drinking. We're not going to be doing that here. In fact, the, the Jewish community says that it, you're supposed to drink so much that you cannot tell Haman f- from Mordecai. Uh, so, but uh, we're not going to do that today. A few minutes ago here, we just reviewed the story in that book. So I'm not really going to review the story in, in this message. But um, as you may or may not know, this book, the book of Esther, is the only book in the Bible that nowhere mentions God. It nowhere mentions God anywhere in this Bible, um, in this book. We might say that as far as the book of Esther is concerned, his face, God's face, was hidden from his people. This book, however, is not the only place in Scripture where God's face was hidden. In fact, we find the same expression used in three times in the book of Deuteronomy, in chapters 31 and, and, and 32. You find it also once in the book of Ezekiel, in chapter 39, verse 29. But the phrase used in the Tanakh is called Hester Panim. Hester is a word that means hiding, the hiding, the hiding of Panim, the Panim, which is the face, hiding of the face. And not only is God himself hidden in the book of Esther, but there are many examples of hiddenness of other things throughout the book, including the very name of the main character, I'm not sure that's well known. Her name is Esther. But the Hebrew word for hiding, just take a look at this, is Esther. Isn't that interesting? That her name itself means hiding, very close to it in Hebrew. Though God himself is hidden in this book, his active presence behind the scenes is unmistakable. You can't miss that. And we can, in a sense, we can see God's invisible hand at work if we take the time to compare the actions of the king and Haman to those of Esther and Mordecai. If you really stop, and and as I did, I went back and looked at at these, uh, the things that happened in this book. And I noticed an amazing sequence of events. Let me share this. To do this best, however, to really see this best, we must remember that we can see God best when. I paused right there in the middle of this thought. When can we see God best? In my opinion, in our rearview mirror, when we see where he has taken us and how he has worked in our lives. You look back in your life and you see God's hand, even though you may not have seen it at the time that you were going through things. So now let's take a look in the rearview mirror of the book of Esther. I'm calling this the visible results of God's invisible hand. It all begins in the year 483 BCE, before the common era, when the king of Persia, King Ahasuerus decides to have a little party, a little party that lasted six months. But when you, if you go to the end of the book of Esther, you find out that it's 
not the king, but Mordecai who calls a party. Now, in the story of the book of Esther, there comes a point where the king sends word to Vashti and says, come, right? He wants, she wants, uh, he wants the, her to show her, all his friends, her beautiful, how beauty she, beautiful she is. But at, almost on the heels of that, we find that Mordecai sends word to Esther to communicate. We find that Haman is promoted to the chief prince, but, and this is rather remarkable, Esther is promoted higher to the queen. The king, as it turns out in the story, we find out, was almost assassinated. But Haman, we find out, is planning to assassinate Mordecai. So the king, the king demands everybody to do what Haman wants, which is bow down to, to Haman. And when Mordecai is asked to, to do that, he reveals to the world that he is a Jew who bows only to God. And you can see as this, as this story is progressing, you can start to see how things are happening. Intent, the intent is one direction, and God turns it around and does something else that you wouldn't have expected. Haman asked the king for permission to kill all the Jews. We know that. Just to give you an idea of what uh, Haman had in mind, I, this is a map of what the Persian Empire looked like in those days. From uh, northern Africa all the way to India. And uh, f you can see how, how, how big the kingdom was. And here's the capital, by the way, of the Persian Empire, Shushan, kind of in the middle of this map. And a little over here is where this little place called Israel was. But if you look carefully, you can see that the map actually covers almost all of what we consider Israel today. And most of the Jewish people did not live in the south at that time because the south was still desert. And so had Haman been successful in killing the Jews in Persia, all the Jews in Persia, he would have eradicated all the Jews everywhere in the known world. It was more threatening than we realize. So after Haman asked for permission to kill all the Jews, Mordecai has turns to the Lord and ends up saying, going to Esther to ask the king to protect the Jews. And the king and Haman sit down together to have a drink. They, they, think, they think everything's fine. Meanwhile, Esther asked all the Jews to fast just before she approached the king. As we know, she's not allowed to go just walk into the king's presence. Haman prepares a gallows for Mordecai because he's so sure that he's going to be able to, to get permission to hang him. And while he's doing that, shortly thereafter, Esther prepares a banquet for the king and Haman. All the all the the turns that are happening in this story, all the things that you wouldn't expect that are happening. It's qu rather quite, am it's quite amazing. Haman comes to the king to ask permission to hang Mordecai. He's got the gallows all ready to go. All he wants is the, the king's thumbs up, and he will arrest Mordecai and hang him from the gallows. But to his surprise, the king sends him, Haman, to honor Mordecai before all the people. I don't think Haman had a thought that that might happen. Haman thinks, because he's invited to this, this banquet at uh, Esther's, Haman thinks Esther's plan is to honor him at this banquet. And it's asked at that very banquet that Esther reveals Haman's plan to kill her and all the Jews reveals that to the king who was unaware of it. See, Haman was mad because Mordecai, a Jew, wouldn't bow down to him. And God took that thought 
and turned it on its ear. Haman is now bowing down before Esther, who was a Jew, albeit hidden for most of the story. But now he gets on his knees and he begs Esther to spare his life. And at the very, in the very process of doing that very thing, as the king had walked out and was, had heard about his plan, what happens? The king comes back in and sees him kind of leaning on Esther's lap, and he condemns Haman for, what are you doing to my wife? He condemns Haman for begging and on, uh, es on ha uh, Esther's lap. Everything that Haman did turned out wrong. He ends up hung on the gallows that he built for Mordecai. And as if that isn't enough, Mordecai is given Haman's house. Haman had received the king's signet ring. That signet ring is now given to Mordecai. Haman wanted the Jews to fear the 13th of Adar, and instead the Jews were feared by their enemies on the 13th of Adar. It just turned, everything is just turned on its, on its head. Haman's plan was to destroy all the Jews, but instead the Jews destroyed all their enemies first. It really is an amazing story. Haman's goal was to annihilate all the Jews, but this is an interesting little twist right at the end. Many Persians actually converted and became Jews because of the high status that the Jews now held in Persia. Would you have ever imagined, would you have ever imagined that all of this would happen? It's, it's one of the most remarkable stories in all of Scripture. And you can see why God was never present physically that you know of. He was certainly present behind the scenes. Everything <laughs> that was looking like it was going the wrong way, God turned it around for good. Reminds you of uh, some Scriptures, doesn't it? While God's name never appeared in the book of Esther, we can see that his hand certainly did. No question. And while we may not always see the hand of God in our own lives, we can still trust the word of God. A very important point to keep in mind in your life. You often, how many of us would love to see God do something that we can recognize. I'm still waiting for that first post-it on my refrigerator that, uh, you know, he's signed God and he's telling me what he wants me to do. But meanwhile, uh, we just move forward. We trust his word. This text jumped out at me at the end. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Trust. Do not rely on your own understanding in all your ways, acknowledge him. And he will show you which path to take. That, of course, is from Proverbs chapter 3, verses 5 and 6. And now I'd uh, like to close in prayer. So just join me in prayer right now. Heavenly Father, I so much thank you for your word. I thank you for your, your presence. Even when we don't see you, we can uh, take comfort that your word tells us um, what your heart is in so many ways and Lord that you are always there and even when we can't see you Lord we can trust you we must trust you Lord you're our only hope and Lord in this story today of, of Esther how you worked behind the scenes to engineer um, everything that was good to come out of everything that was evil it's just amazing and a reminder Lord how you can bring good from what seems to be evil in this world I, I know, uh, as I look around right now, there are s so many things that uh, don't seem right. And yet, we know that you're still on the throne and you're still in control. And I take great comfort in that. May we all do that very thing.
and we thank you for for preserving this amazing story that we might uh, ha again have seen you working behind the scenes may it be an encouragement to each one of us i pray with thanksgiving in yeshua's precious name amen <laughs>